Um, sorry, as Alistair was speaking then, I quickly just um, pulled up our research group Twitter page so that I could direct you to it because I couldn't remember what it was called. Um, but yeah, I'm Debbie. I'm a... Um, I'm a lecturer and also a PhD student at Leeds Beckett University, so I'm literally in the final stages of just writing up my thesis. It sounds really easy, but I've got about two months left to finalise it and hand it in and hopefully pass my viva. Um, so I'm going to share some of my research with you today around nutrition for the young player, um, but also what's out there in the wider field as well. Um, and as Al mentioned, I'm part of the Carnegie Adolescent, no sorry, it's now Carnegie Applied Rugby Research Centre. Um, so we have nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches, um, psychologists, a whole group of people working within that centre, all within adolescent and youth athletes. Um, so I looked up their Twitter handle for you, and it's C A R R underscore L B U. So it's standing for Carnegie Applied Rugby. Be research underscore Leeds Beckett University um, and they're constantly putting um, things out about our research um, so I just thought I should let you know about my background and qualifications I'm probably stood in the way of the slides here sorry um, so I did my undergraduate in sport and exercise science and then I did a master's in sport and exercise nutrition. Um, I then, it doesn't mean you're qualified as a nutritionist just from doing that, so then I went and got my um, registration with the Association for Nutrition. Um, Isaac is, um, you've seen people go around pinching the body fat with the calipers. <laughs> that's the, you have to spend three days learning how to do that properly, um, so that's my qualification there. Um, like Al, I'm also a national trainer for UK anti-doping. I was the lead nutritionist for Leeds Rhinos and Yorkshire Carnegie for four years before um, I took on my lecturing post two years ago. So I looked after all of the senior players and all of the academy players. Luckily, I was collecting data at that time point, so all the academy players wanted to come and be a part of my research. That was amazing. <laughs> um, and now at the minute my applied work is with, mainly with TAS athletes and um, we've got an international um, academic and soccer academy at our university so I kind of give them nutrition support. And then my whole PhD research area is dietary requirements of adolescent rugby players, so very broad um, but hopefully I can try and give you a bit of an insight into some of that today. I'll try and leave some time for questions at the end, but if at any point you've got a question, just give me a shout and I'll try and answer it as we go along as well. Um, so I thought you might be interested in finding out how much energy does a young player actually need. We know the general health guidelines, but there's not actually much in rugby. Um, where should that come from? So what types of foods, when should we be eating it? Um, what, and what about fluid as well? And I'll go a little bit into supplements, but then Al's going to do most of the anti-doping um, work with you later on in the day. So hopefully, um, I'm kind of aware of the importance of nutrition, um, but obviously from a young age, our players are still growing and developing. Um, and one of the big concerns is around their bone health. Now we find actually in rugby players that bone health is pretty good because they are in a contact sport, they undertake resistance training. Um, so I've had old players on um, a DEXA scanner and it's like a full x-ray of the body apart from it uses less radiation and um, it compares total bone mineral content and bone mineral density to the general population, like kind of like they've got reference values in the database and it shows that rugby players are way above the general population and that's because they eat more, they train more, they resistance train. Um, but we know nutrition can also help prevent illness um, and just generally help us with our health. But all of this means that firstly we need to be within energy balance. And what I mean by that is the average male um, is recommended that you consume about 2,500 calories or about 2,000 for a female. If you start to um, 
eat more than you expend, you're going to put weight on, and if you're eating less, you're going to lose body mass. Um, for our players, we want them to be in a slightly positive energy balance because they're growing, and I'm sure alongside their training, you want to eventually see an increase in their muscle mass. Um, and where should that come from? Well, it always comes back down to the very, very basics. I am going to go into some more sports nutrition, um, but they're, they're probably doing this in school, the Eat Well Guide. Um, we want them to be eating their five fruit and vegetables every day. We want them to be having enough starchy carbohydrate foods to get their energy for training. We want them to be having plenty of milk and dairy foods. Um, for adults, it's about two to three servings, but for the young rugby player, because we get the calcium from here for their bone growth, we want it to be about four servings per day. So when I say a serving, I mean um, half a pint of milk, a small pot of yogurt, Cheese, it's actually really tiny. It's a matchbox piece size of cheese. Um, so if they wanted to get it all from milk, um, four, uh, sorry, two pints of milk, that's their four servings, then absolutely fine. Um, however, with fruit and vegetables, we want it to be different. So if they eat five bananas in one day, they're getting the same vitamins and minerals, we're not going to give them five servings. It has to be different. Um, and then the protein foods, we want two to three servings per day for the average population. We've got to remember we do get protein from other foods, so if they're having plenty of milk and dairy foods, they should be getting their protein from there as well. Um, we need two servings of fish per week from that group. One should be oily. Some of you are now smiling, thinking, yeah, right, as if my kids are going to eat oily, oily fish. <laughs> um, but we try and encourage them to do that because we know that um, it's got, um, it helps with inflammation from training, particularly when they've had a heavy collision-based training session. So I guess my thoughts are always if we talk to them about the impact it can have on performance, they're more likely to buy into it a little bit more rather than the health side that they're hammered with already at school. And my first study... Um, Back in 2015 with um, an academy group, there were 87 players that were part of this and um, I used rugby league and rugby union players and we could see that it didn't matter which code they were in, their dietary intakes didn't significantly differ from one another. Um, but what you might expect is that under 19s had more energy about 400 calories more energy per day. Um, so under 16s were about 3,000 calories per day and under 19s were heading up towards 3,400 calories per day. Um, protein, again, the under 19s consumed more than the under 16s and they had more fluid than the under 16s. <coughs> I think part of the reason for that is because the under 16s were actually rubbish at reporting what they had to drink, they kept forgetting. <laughs> Some of them, when they're handing back in their diet diary, they say, are you sure you didn't have a drink all day? I had to check through every single diet diary with each of the players. Like, oh yeah, I have a drink with every meal. I'm like, right, let's write that down. <laughs> Um, and under 19s consumed a better quality diet than under 16s. Now that doesn't mean that it was great. <laughs> So in black are the recommendations, and then the darker grey are the under 19 players, and the lighter grey are under 16 players. Um, so we can see fruit and vegetables, yes, under 19s did report to consume more fruit and vegetables, but they still didn't even hit the, on average, they didn't hit getting their five a day, which is what we need for our basic health. Um, milk and dairy, again, um, under 19s were almost hitting that. Under 16s, we need to get more into their diet. And then fats and sugars, <laughs> plenty of those. So I worked that out based on um, one serving being about 100 calories. So that's um, like a packet of quavers or um, one Kit Kat. Um, so they were having three or four times that every day. Um, and then protein, they're all pretty good at getting their protein in. And then the interesting thing, um, 
after this study, I also did more of a longitudinal study, so this was conducted during a pre-season, but then um, I looked at dietary intakes during an in-season and then a further pre-season, so for a whole year, um, dietary intake data, it was in a smaller group of um, players. But the nutrition intake didn't really change depending on the season, which I was hoping it might have done, given that training's different um, over the course of the season. Um, and I also thought that supplementation, if they were taken, it might have been higher during pre-season than it was in season, but it didn't really change at all. And the interesting thing was that it made less than a 6% contribution to their, to their nutritional requirements. Um, so it depends which macronutrient you look at, whether it was carbohydrate, protein, fat, but some made an even smaller contribution. And we all know that there's the risk with consuming supplements from contamination, which I will go into. Um, but it's just not adding up for me. If it's such a small contribution from your diet, then and when there's such a risk associated with supplementation, then why are we doing it if we know that a ban can start at four years out of sport? Um, and in the younger players, it tends to be from energy drinks um, and multivitamins. In the older players, it starts coming from protein shakes, um, some creatine, some fish oils is what I was seeing. So we took away from that study that although they can meet all of the recommendations in terms of um, energy, carbohydrate, protein, fats, fluids, it's not coming from the right sources. Um, so we were seeing lots of cereal bars, um, sweets around training, which is fine, but for me, only if you've had your minimum five fruit and vegetables per day, because you're still getting sugars from fruit and vegetables. Um, we want to see more nutritious foods, so sometimes we call these kind of foods empty calories. So you get the calories from them, you get the carbohydrates, proteins, fats, but you're not getting all your vitamins and minerals that you could be getting from your yogurts, your porridge, your um, hummus, nuts and seeds, fruit and vegetables. I kind of went through this at the beginning telling you what a serving size was from the eat well plate. Um, so fruit and vegetables, it needs to be a fist size. It's actually worked out as 80 grams, um, but obviously you're not gonna go around and weigh everything that you um, have to eat, so a fist size. Um, some examples of foods that give you about 50 grams of carbohydrate is, um, it's about a cup size. If you, you know if you have the measuring cups at home, a cup size of dried um, pasta or rice. It's a couple of slices of malt loaf, some tortillas. Um, Protein, we want to try and get about 120 grams of fish in one serving, or at least 100 grams of, well, it's about palm size, 100 grams of meat, or three large eggs will give us about 20 grams of protein. I went through the milk and dairy earlier. Um, we want to get healthier fats in, so nuts and seeds, half an avocado, and then every time they consume sugary foods, we want to try and keep it to no more than 100 calories at a time. Okay, so when I um, started my research back in 2014, um, there was, in adolescent players, there was one study which was done in Japanese players. Um, this is the Imamura et al, and they split them between forwards and backs. And there was one other study um, in Irish schoolboy rugby union players, but they didn't actually record dietary intakes, they just did questionnaires about their practices and what they knew and what they said they did. Um, so mine added to this research and um, we showed that rugby players, adolescent, are having about 3,000 to 3,500 calories per day. Um, during the pre-season, it's all done in senior players, they're having reporting to not actually have that much more than uh, adolescent players and in season um, it's a mixture of league and union players there um, but they're reporting to have between three and a half to 4,300 calories per day. 
But what we found out was, obviously when you're writing down what you have to eat and drink, it's very easy to miss things off. You have to rely on memory. It depends how literate you are, if you can be bothered keeping a diet diary. Um, so people have started to measure energy expenditure. And um, it started off with this group from Liverpool, John Moores, and they used sensewear um, bands um, on the players' arms. And um, the only thing is, they couldn't wear them in water. So I don't know about um, your, the age of your players, but certainly in senior players who this was measured with, they use it swimming as recovery from training sessions. Um, so we didn't capture that, but also during heavy contact, they had to take them off, otherwise they'd just end up smashing them to pieces. So, um, but even bearing that in mind, they showed that, um, which way around is this? I think it's forwards. Yeah, forwards 3,800 calories per day and backs nearly 3,350 calories per day. However, we then used a gold standard measure. And this costs £1,000 per player, so it really is good stuff. And they, it's about this much water that they have to drink. And um, it's got an isotope in it, and um, it tracks. Um, we we kind of measure it through their urine. So you have to collect lots of urine samples over a two-week period. And, uh, oh gosh, when I did this for my study, I had the lovely job of filtering it all, and oh, it was vile. But anyway, we got some really good data from it. <laughs> um, Liverpool John Moores did it first in some senior rugby league players. And uh, first of all, they re measured what it took for their senior players to lay down and do nothing all day. And just for the senior players to lay down and do nothing, it's 1,900 calories. So that's only 600 calories less than what the typical man is advised to consume for their whole daily energy expenditure. Then when you use, look at the doubly labelled water, which includes that, they're, they're expending almost 5,500 calories per day. But then my question was, well, what are the adolescent players doing? Because they're still growing um, and developing, and they don't just play rugby. They play cricket, they go cycling, they, whatever else they're involved in. Um, so I actually used... Um, under 16 players, under 20 players, and then I looked at some of the younger senior players to try and get an idea um, of what they were doing. Um, rugby union players did weigh in a bit heavier, so we have to bear this in mind um, when we look at the results. Um, under 20s, they were similar between codes, um, quite similar between um, the, the younger of the senior players. Um, the training, mm, kind of similar. Rugby union, potentially doing a bit more on the heavier training days when we recorded this. Um, but then rugby league were doing more lighter training days. Um, these guys are quite similar, under 20s, and um, I'd say rugby league senior players were doing a bit more. So this is, we measured their resting metabolic rate. When they lay down, do nothing, they're completely fasted, we put a gas mask on their face, they lie for half an hour and then we put it into equations and work it out what it would take to sit and do nothing all day. Um, so this middle line, this is their average. Um, so we can see in this group of players, during the in-season period, sit and do nothing, the under 16 rugby, ple rugby league players 2,250 calories. Rugby Union, just over 2,000 calories. Their total energy expenditure, about 4,000 calories, just under for the under 16 players. Um, between the two codes, to sit and do nothing, there was about a 200 calorie difference, but we had to do stats on it and um, it showed that it wasn't significantly different. So on average, to try and make this a bit easier to take information away from it, on average, under 16s expend about 4,000 calories per day using a gold standard measure. 
it increases by about 350 calories as they, a day as they progress up to under 20s and then under 24s um, about another 400 and so calories. Obviously they're all different body weights so then we looked at this relative to body mass as well um, and when you look at it relative to the body mass it's the under 20 age group that are actually expending the most energy um, followed by the under 16s and then the senior players um, and then we know that the amount of muscle mass that you have can change your energy expenditure so we looked at this um, this is meaning fat free mass here so basically their muscle mass um, and when we look at it relative to their fat free mass it's the same the under 20 players are the ones that are expending the most energy followed by the under 16s followed by the senior players now this is um, just in case there's any practitioners or people um, kind of estimating energy expenditures what this also showed I compared it to the prediction equations we use so if you go to see a nutritionist and you're asking oh, how much does my young rugby player need to be eating they'd use prediction equations um, but what this study has shown is that these prediction equations under predict typically for um, rugby players um, so we need to work on getting some better prediction equations in rugby so we started looking a colleague of mine um, then started looking at well you know where wh why is it obviously rugby players are bigger so we we expend more energy but what's the impact of collisions on this so he used the doubly labelled water again um, and he set up a typical training session this was in rugby league players um, but adolescents still and he set up this training grid and um, it's five meters in width so that they couldn't avoid any collisions and um, they did 10 one-on-one -on -one collisions so where they were tackling and then they did 10 hit-ups as well so 20 collisions and um, they found that just 20 collisions over a five day period increased their energy expenditure by about 1,250 calories. So just 20. And obviously they're doing more than 20 collisions. He picked 20 because um, that was the average number of collisions that rugby league players are exposed to in a match. Um, and that was senior players. But obviously um, we've got more static exertions in um, rugby union. Um, the other thing they reported was that their rating, sessional rating of perceived exertion was much higher during the collision session because they did one with collisions, one without and then crossed it over so that's how they worked it out. Um, and then also they, they measured well-being and it was, um, there was quite a big decrease in that the following day from the collision session. We know that it takes about 48 to 72 hours for the muscles to recover following the collision session. Um, some colleagues have measured that with um, blood samples, looking at creatine kinase levels in the blood. So it takes them two to three days to recover. Oh yeah, I should have shown you that, sorry. So that, that was the difference between the um, non-collision and the, the, the contact training sessions. So it's quite funny because when you do the stats, it says there's negligible differences. But to me, 350, 450 calories in practice is a huge difference in terms of what we eat. Imagine if we all ate an three, extra 350 calories a day, um, we'd certainly see a difference. So um, basically what we're saying is, for me, there are differences between the age groups and what they need to eat. Um, I don't know if you spotted earlier, but the rugby league resting metabolic rate was slightly higher than the rugby union, but we think that might be because of the differences in the training exposure that I showed you right at the beginning. Um, and then the remaining components of total energy expenditure. So um, 
we've got our resting metabolic rate we've got our exercise activity thermogenesis we also expend energy from what we're eating and digesting that food but then we've got what's neat the neat activity and this is what makes the big difference in what all our players are doing so the neat activity is non-exercise activity time so if you've got the type of players that will go and sit on their playstation or xbox when they're not training sit down do school work homework or if you've got the really active kind of players who are up and about always i don't know going to work with dad helping dad out or um off in the garden playing football and it's that bit that makes the big difference to our players what they do outside of rugby um so we know that just a single collision training session considerably increases their total energy expenditure and um, so we need to be fueling the muscle damage caused um, alongside the work required and the prediction equations that we have if anyone's ever predicting what your player might need question that how did you calculate it <laughs> um, because actually they underestimate quite a bit okay so next part if the, oh, is there any questions before I move on to the next bit no so the next part is starting to consider where's this energy coming from so we need to make sure we're getting the right type of food so we've spoken about the kind of the balance where it should come from um, the balance i was going to say the balance of good health but that's really outdated the eat well guide um, also the timing so for example if you have a cup of tea or coffee is there an appropriate time to drink that um, we know that it takes about 60 minutes before caffeine um, we feel we have a response in our body so if for any reason young players are drinking teas and coffees then try and drink them at a more appropriate time to benefit your performance when should we eat meals when should we be drinking and how much so all of these next two slides I'm going to show you, I've got a handout if you want to grab these on your way out and it's all written down for you. Um, but the guidelines are two to four hours before training we want to be having a balanced meal. So we want it to have all the macronutrients, the carbohydrates, proteins and fats. We want it to have all the food groups, so or as many as possible from that eat well guide at the beginning. So fruit and vegetables, starchy foods, milk and dairy proteins, um, some good sources of fats, and some fluid with that. Now you'll notice I've put jump into the cycle where appropriate. I know most of the players will probably have evening training sessions, but I appreciate if it's a morning training session, you're not going to get them up two to four hours before a session to eat a big balanced meal. So just jump in at the appropriate point. So if you've only got 60 minutes before training, um, then we want the fast releasing carbohydrates. At this point, proteins are not a priority because we're not getting our energy from proteins and the fats are not a priority. So I'm not saying don't eat fat, I'm just saying that it probably wants to be, be lower in fat because we know that fat can slow down our digestion rate. Um, so here, fruit and vegetables, have a banana, malt loaf. Uh, any kind of fruit really um, you're just going to get your sugars your fast releasing carbohydrates at this point and again some fluid during training the recommendations are that we should have 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour but only if training is longer than 90 minutes so when you've got 60 minute training session with kids they don't need sports drinks um, especially if they fuel before and they're going to recover with food after training um, maybe in a game if they're playing 80 minutes but for me I don't think we need to be having sports drinks and especially when you see kids two hours before a training session drinking them in the car or on the bus <laughs> you've tried to get rid of that energy by the time you get to training because you're always trying to maintain your blood glucose levels and a sports drink is just going to push them sky high too early um, 
I've put a picture of high juice on here because one of the things you can do if you feel like they need a little bit of sugar um, is use the high juice um, and dilute it or you can do 50-50 um, fresh orange juice or apple juice or cranberry juice with water and that gives you a similar carbohydrate content to a sports drink and is obviously much cheaper. And then after, 30 minutes after training, our priorities are carbohydrates and proteins. So we want to replenish the energy that we've lost and we want to start repairing our muscles. And we've got this more anabolic environment straight after training. So um, the reason I put a picture of chocolate milk on there is because there's loads of research into the benefits of chocolate milk. Whether that be a Yazoo or um, a Morrison's own chocolate milkshake, I'm sure banana or strawberry would be fine but um, it ticks so many boxes you've got the carbohydrates from the sugars that are in there you've got the protein from the milk you've got the calcium from the milk which we know is important for bone growth it's a fluid so if they don't always feel like eating straight after training it's always easier to digest fluid it's got electrolytes in there naturally in the milk um, which is the kind of thing we try and get out of sports drinks. So it's already in there. Um, and for me, it, it's the perfect snack. To, and if you're having about just under a pint, you can get 50, about 15, almost up to 20 grams of protein, depending on the brand that you use. Um, so in the car, coming straight off the pitch, wherever, um, but try and get that within 30 minutes and then follow that up with a balanced meal. Um, so evening meal when they get home from training. Um, I appreciate sometimes though that might be very late and they might have managed to get their big meal in before training. So then we will jump to the before bed snack. Before bed, um, Milk and dairy foods, they've got a high content of casein, which is a slow releasing protein. Um, so it's recommended that we have those kind of snacks before bed to help our body repair throughout the night while we're sleeping. I put a picture of skier yogurt in there. Now they are quite expensive. Um, but you can also get them from Lidl and Aldi now everywhere. Tesco's own brand, for example, are starting to do these high protein yogurts. And it's the thing to point out is it's not Greek style yogurt, it's Greek yogurt. And when you look on the back, there's a difference because the Greek yogurt has 10 grams of protein for every 100 grams that you eat. Whereas the Greek style, it hasn't been strained, which is why it's not as thick in consistency as the Greek yogurts. So the protein concentration isn't as high. Um, so where possible, a milk and dairy snack before bed. Um, so milk, um, high protein yogurts, cottage cheese with some crackers or um, a small bit of cheese on toast or, you know, some milk and dairy. <laughs> And then I thought it was good to point out here as well, um, healthier choices means you get to eat more food. So if you, we had a Costa across from our training grounds and so many times I'd see players walking in with latte and flapjacks, like, well, I've got my milk from my latte and I've got a flapjack loads of carbohydrates. And I was like, yeah, but it's also got loads of fat in it, which is slowing down your digestive system right now. And you're probably not gonna get those carbohydrates until when you're going home. 632 calories, 60 grams of carbs, 20 grams of protein, 35 grams of fat. Not bad, but you could eat half a tin of beans, three slices of toast and three eggs for the same calories, get more carbohydrate, more protein and slightly less fat. Um, if it's morning, for example, a large bowl of porridge with banana and handful of nuts, Similar energy content, but better nutrition profile. Um, okay, these are slightly less calories, but um, other options, bagels with cottage cheese, um, the high protein yogurt with berries and a piece of fruit. So surely that's, um, I'm hoping that's good persuasion. You can eat more if you eat healthier. <laughs> um, so now I'm gonna focus on 
micronutrients, fluid, and um, a tiny bit on supplements. So for the young athlete, all the recommendations suggest that iron um, is a key micronutrient because it helps with red blood cell formation and oxygen transport around the body. And calcium, because we keep mentioning it's good for your bones, your teeth, um, it actually helps with muscle contractions as well. And then the other one is vitamin D. Um, because it helps us absorb our calcium um, and therefore it helps in our bone and teeth formation. Um, as a general population, we're deficient in vitamin D anyway, so actually it's quite key for everyone, not just the adolescent player. Oh, sorry, I've got my slides a little bit mixed up here. I'll come back to the fluid then later. Um, so I did a study where I measured the blood concentrations of the players, and um, Calcium's actually really well regulated within the blood. So if we don't eat enough calcium, you take it out of your bones. And then if you're eating too much calcium, you'll end up excreting it. So it's really well regulated. So actually what we saw was pretty much everyone, <coughs> apart from five players or so, were within the recommended ranges. Um, we also measured bone health alongside that, and as I said to you earlier, their bone health was absolutely fine. Um, so it's still important to keep the, that calcium intake up through the milk and dairy foods, um, but typically because they do so much of the training, rugby players, their actual calcium serum status is it's pretty good. The one that concerns me is the vitamin D, so 25 OHD is the marker of um, vitamin D that we measure in our blood. And um, so I looked at rugby union and rugby league, so I'll focus on rugby union for you. Now this was measured in season March to April time, so kind of spring time. And their levels were down at deficient and severely deficient. Um, I was writing this up the other day and um, I started writing for the, because the rugby league players, they were measured um, in the early summer months, and I started writing, surprisingly, their vitamin D levels were still really low, and then I looked outside and it was chucking it down, and this was only like a couple of weeks ago, so I started thinking, is it that surprising really in our climate? Um, but yeah, certainly here we need to be looking at increasing vitamin D foods, although Foods are really low in vitamin D because we synthesize the majority of it from the sun. Um, and the other thing was iron that I measured. Um, and typically they're all okay, but the only thing is with this measure is that collisions in, and inflammation in the body increase um, ferritin levels, which is the marker of iron. So I really want to push that they are getting enough iron because this could also be a, almost be a false negative reading because they, they could just be within that because they've got some inflammation in the body because they've been involved in some kind of collisions the day before. I couldn't control for the training. It's in season. These are academy players. I can't say you've only got two days with the club and you're not allowed to train on this day. So um, we do still need to push that they're getting enough iron. Um, that's kind of summarizing what I've told you. So um, my advice from that is if we do any micronutrient interventions, it might not be different for the young and the senior players. Um, we need to increase our vitamin D intake even in the early summer months. Um, so try and get that from food first. So oily fish, eggs, for example. Um, then we might need to consider supplementation and ensure a good iron intake from food, so your green leafy vegetables, your red meats. And the actual health guidelines suggest that from October to March, anyone over, the five, year, over five years old should be having a vitamin D supplement that is 10 micrograms. And that's because one in five people have low vitamin D levels in the UK. Um, and we know the importance of why we should be consuming it.
However, <laughs> providing that you, the players have a healthy, balanced diet, there should be no need to supplement other than the vitamin D, I'd say. Um, the example I've put up here is um, a menu plan of what the senior players were consuming that I was working with. So this was for a 100 kilo player. So they were having, um, on light or rest training days, they were having yogurt and berries and fruit for breakfast or eggs and avocado. Um, they were having tuna salad with new potatoes, um, fruit or hummus and pita snacks. Um, steaks with sweet potato because sweet potato also counts as one of your five a day um, with uh, vegetables in the evening you'll see they always had their um, milk and dairy rich snack um, throughout the day they were having um, they actually had whey protein because to try and meet their protein requirements when you've got a 100 120 kilo player it's a lot of protein to eat so they use shakes um, saurine fruit and they got their meals provided um, during the day um, but just to kind of put into context the amount of food that they're actually having to eat to meet those energy requirements we spoke about earlier So I guess the thing is, there is no miracle cure. If something sounds too good to be true on the side of a supplement, then it probably is. Um, you even get things like this saying the next best thing to fruit and vegetables. Well, why would you want to be second best when you're a rugby player? You want to win. You want to, you want to be the best. And I appreciate that sometimes supplements can be more cost effective, certainly at this side. So. If you struggle to get your young rugby players to eat oily fish and they have to take fish oil tablets, well actually it does work out cheaper but obviously we want to try and push that they get it through their diet um, just because we tend to absorb them better when, um, as food when it's consumed with other foods. Um, creatine as well. Um, the amount of creatine, you, sorry, the amount of steak you'd have to eat to get the recommended amount of creatine if you started moving on to creatine supplementation it would cost you an absolute fortune and I'd, I'm not sure you could physically eat it in one day through red meat um, whereas it's 60, uh, 6p for a, a, a scoop of creatine for a maintenance phase dose um, but kind of at the level that we're talking about, hopefully the only thing they're really using um, is they're wanting is energy from sports drink and a protein source, which if you're getting batch tested protein, which everyone should be using if they were to use it, it's actually more expensive than a pint of milk and we've spoken about how many more boxes the milk ticks um, and making your own sports drink is cheaper than buying them as well. Um, this word cloud is um, what I used, um, so the bigger the word, um, that meant that there was more consumption from that area, so under 19s players consume the most protein, and down here we've got under 19s micronutrients which was quite a lot lower. Um, so. Firstly, it was under 19s that consumed protein, then it was under 16s that consumed energy supplements, then it was under 19s consuming energy supplements, and so on. Um, so, just to give a picture of where supplementation was coming from. Now, there was some research by um, the International Olympic Committee, and they took products off the shelves, some were bought off the internet, um, but they didn't get them from the pro-hormone companies, so you'd expect that they'd be okay supplements. Um, and of the ones that came off the UK shelves, nearly 20% had something in them that would lead to a positive test. And the unfortunate thing for an athlete is that the strict liability 
quote from you can to doping. So it's something you can you can not delegate or ignore. You are solely responsible for any banned substance you use, attempt to use, or is found in your system, regardless of how it got there or whether there is an intention to cheat or not. So if you have happened to buy one of those supplements off the shelf in the UK, the athlete, the, there's no excuses really. It's, it's all down to the athlete, it's their responsibility. And any player that plays with the club that's part of the RFU are eligible for testing, which is a scary thing. Um, I actually did this search last year, um, sorry I didn't get time to do a more up to date one and have a little look, but last year when I did this, um, of the sanctions on the UK Anti-Doping website, 48% of them came from rugby, so it's quite scary. <laughs> So the practitioner's approach then is that we have a fir food first approach and um, we're not relying on supplements first. So we need to make sure if players do end up, I mean, if someone's got an iron deficiency, for example, I'm not saying don't take supplements. So if they do need to take them, we just need to make sure that we're getting, uh, taking responsibility to make sure they're checked. Um, Al will go into this more, but we've got um, Informed Sport, which is a batch testing pro program that you can to open, recommend that our athletes are using to check supplements. Then we get to this um, grey area of all these protein foods that are now coming out. And um, so for example, this Snickers protein, a normal Snickers has three or four grams of protein in it, but if you get this one, the protein one, it's got 18 grams. Well, we have to start questioning where's that protein coming from? And we need to be looking at the ingredients. So is it coming from food or is it has it had a supplement added to it and if it has where's that supplement come from how's that been batch tested um here again whey protein isolate this one says from milk but some of them will have supplements added in um and again the protein drinks as well we've got to be really careful and make sure we're checking the ingredients um, there's the Clean Sport app as well, which is really good, um, which I'd suggest you get all of the players to be downloading onto their phone because there's a wealth of information on there. Um, and yeah, this is... Um, this was to remind me to say that um, we can tell our players who are blue in the face what they should be doing, what they should be eating, but until we provide them with the capability, the opportunities and the motivation, they're not going to change their behaviours. So that's why today we're actually going to get them making their own recovery shakes. So we can keep telling them, don't take supplements, don't take supplements, bring your own food, but unless they know what they need to be putting into that and how they do it themselves, it's not going to happen. So that's why we're doing that workshop today, to start making a step forward in doing that. Um, and it's something we constantly did um, at Leeds Rhinos and Yorkshire Carnegie. We, off the field, we always had nutrition education sessions, cooking sessions, got the chefs involved as well. Sorry, the battery is about to go on us just in time. <laughs> So, any questions? Yes. You mentioned the benefit of diet. In terms of development, what difference does that make to a young person's performance of the season? Anything there, high sugar, high fat, as opposed to being sort of five hundred a day. It's the first question. And what evidence is there? What difference does it make to when we climb up? You're dealing with teenagers. You're going to give you some examples of places where you pay to make this difference. Is there anything out there that can you explain to well, do you know, the research that I've read actually shows that at this age, they don't see the relevance, which I guess is what you're getting at. Um, 
so I, for me, it's always just talking about how it's going to impact their performance now, because um, that's what they're interested in. Um, if they don't see the relevance of how it's going to influence their health when they're older. I mean, I guess you can start talking about bone health and um, if they've got poor bone health, it only deteriorates as you get older and therefore you're going to be more susceptible to injuries and it's going to shorten your playing career. Um, but for me, yeah, it's kind of telling them about your performance now. So if you can just goes into whether there's a difference between what male and male and female adolescents need, would you have any experience of different classes? In rugby, no. Um, literally my um, first study back in 2015 was one of the first. There's more coming out in males, but there's still, I've not seen a study in, might be one rugby sevens one, but they're older, it's not adolescent. More starting to come out slowly, so hopefully we start to see more, but no. In general nutrition terms, other than the you know, absolute calorie difference, is there, is there much of a difference between men and female? Yeah, well, in terms of general health guidelines, it's the iron um, micronutrient that needs to be higher for females. Um, and like you say, it would be the energy differences. Um, but other than that, like just trying to get them to eat healthy, <laughs> um, eat around training, not leaving. I know a lot of them will have their lunch at 12 o'clock and then come to training and be tired and then starving after because they've left about a six hour gap before training so it's just really trying to push all the basics to them because yeah there's no research in female adolescents in rugby yet. If you compared this to other sports or is there any comparisons to other sports so if you compared current men compared to football or athletics is there much difference for rugby players compared to the sports are they needing more? Rugby is definitely higher, yeah, just because of the collision aspect of it. Um, there are some studies that looked at adolescents and they've looked at non-athletic populations compared to athletic populations and that increases energy expenditure by about 350 calories per day um, and that's because the athletic population are doing about four to five hours more physical activity per week than the non-athletic um, and then yeah rugby kind of adds on that extra if, if they're undertaking lots of collisions and about an extra 300 calories a day. Yeah. So, if you, so, if you had a match on Sunday, or most new bar, where they're going to take the majority of the vision set, should they increase their calorie intake for the next three days of certain things to have the rebuilding of the, the muscles and everything? Or is it a constant level you should take in that to the calories every day? Or do you alter to how to fit around your training and your matches? Yeah, so there is um, what we call nutrition periodization. So we do talk about um, kind of matching the, the work that you undertake. So yeah, on match days we would expect it to be higher and after heavy training sessions as well as a match, um, it would be higher. But I think naturally they would feel hungrier in most cases. I mean, some of you might struggle. <laughs> and. But you know what, the general rule of thumb, if you've got a player and they're not maintaining or putting on weight, then yeah, they need to be eating more around training sessions um, and yeah, the couple of days after, um, especially if they start losing weight, then that's an obvious sign that they're not eating enough. But yeah, so things like carbohydrate foods are the key energy provider around training, so that's what we try and periodise around their training sessions. Yeah. Uh, good question, yeah. So the the milk no matter whether it's semi skimmed, full whole milk, whole fat, whatever, um, the protein content is the same, the calcium content is the same. 
it's just the energy that changes from the fat. So if you've got a player that's struggling to put on weight um, or maintain, then I'd go for the full fat option. Um, if you use semi-skimmed milk and they're absolutely fine, then continue using that. Yeah, and that's true. It's just because the fat slows down your digestion rate, so it takes longer to empty from your stomach, so you've got that feeling of being fuller for longer. Yeah. Also, the type of carbohydrate foods that you eat can... Um, it, so if you're having the low glycemic index carbohydrates, the, the brown pastas, rice, the wholemeal breads, um, they also give you that more steady release of fuel and keep you fuller for longer, as opposed to the sugary um, white breads and sugary foods. amazing <laughs> yeah um, oh, some people have started um, getting Yazoo just Yazoo drinks in available to buy even if you can't afford to give them out for free um, yeah definitely and I think that's it giving making the environment making it available to them as well where you can give them the opportunity um, so even sometimes if it's um, oh I skipped past it in the end didn't I the hydration slide I showed a, there was a picture of a pee chart if you can put pee charts up in the toilet and they've just been to the toilet, oh yeah my urine's looking a bit dark I'm a bit dehydrated right I'll go get a bottle of water on my way out and just giving them those nudges constantly because you could get someone in to do a one hour workshop but then if they're not reminded out of sight out of mind and all that <laughs> Okay, um, in the interest of time, uh, there is a round of sort of drinking tea breaks.